Welcome to the Scrapbook of Life with Teresa Khalil, a podcast on my journey to understand life, solve its mystery, and live it fully. And on my journey, I met Mia Lambert, who, in my opinion, is living a rich life. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I was living now, now not so much. It's now work and go home and work and go home. <laughs> but it was rich when I was younger. Uh, a fellow questioner who changed her belief not once but twice. Yes. From Christianity, Catholicism to Krishna consciousness, and then from Krishna consciousness to what we will discover today. Mia, I'm really excited to uh, go through your uh, life timeline and uh, document it in the scrapbook of life. And I'm looking forward to seeing this experience of existence through your mm -hmm. eyes. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited too. So are you ready? Yes, yes. Come and with me flip through the pages of the scrapbook of life. Before we start, I would like to remind you that you can go to the YouTube channel Unique TV uh, if you want to see the visual aids and photos we are going to use to help in telling the story. We will start with what is known as the beginning of every human being, uh, the beginning of this experience of existence, which is birth. So I would like you to tell me what is your birth story, like when, where, what was the circumstances? If you know, how was the delivery? Um, how was the world at that time? So your birth story in a nutshell. Okay, so I was born in 1978. It was a country called Yugoslavia then. Um, I was born in a family. I, I mean, I had a mother and a father and was living with the grandparents. And what happened then is actually that the family was dysfunctional. There was no love. So it, you know, it changed me later. I had a, a lot of issues with self-esteem in the beginning as a child and teenager and a young adult. The birth, uh, I was born two weeks premature. And my mom tells me that it was easy birth. Actually, she came for a checkup and ended up uh, birthing me three hours later. So it was great. But later she told me that actually I was taken uh, from her after the birth and I saw her the next day, which I think had some consequences later on me. So this is a birth, basically. So I usually start by saying it all began when once upon a time a baby was born and they named her not Mia Lambert. <laughs> So, yes. <laughs> so what uh, did they name you? <laughs> uh, my name was Maya, Maya Latskovic. So it was different. Uh, my mother didn't want it. We have in Croatia these names, Anna, Ankitsa, you know, Kata, Katica. She, she didn't like that. She wanted a short name that cannot have this Itza on the end. And also mm -hmm. at that time, there was this cartoon, uh, Maya the Bee. And so she gave me name Maya. Why did you change your name? Uh, I changed my name in 2014 after I I was sick uh, from living in temple and my life was completely messed up. I felt, you know, like th that I'm uh, running in circles and uh, I was into numerology prior to that. So mm -hmm. a couple of years prior to that. Also, there was a issue with my father and my parents separated and my father married another Maya. <laughs> so we had the same name also, you know, my Alats, which both of us. And I also mm -hmm. felt that when when that happened, that in my family, I became my Alats, which number two. Mm -hmm. And that really, you know, like shocked me. Because mm -hmm. my father's, uh, uh, my father wasn't close to me anyway, but my grandmother, you know, she loved me also as, as her granddaughter, but, you know, her, her son was first and whatever was with her son, it was, you know, the priority. So I became my Latskovich number two. Uh -huh. And uh, sec uh, third, uh, my name Maya. Nobody ever called me Maya. And that's it. They always called me Maya the Bee. Or in the temple, they called me Maya Devi, which means almost the devil, you know. Uh -huh. So it was never just Maya, you know. 
So I wanted to be me, and that when somebody calls my name, it's just me, no, not something uh, bee or whatever animal or you know something I wanted to be. And uh, me, uh, since I'm I'm born on sixth of August in numerology, six is my number, you know. And so Mia has the number six. And then I I connected to a numerologist only to ask him advice on how to do it, you know, legally. And I was waiting for his answer for like three days. And after three, I thought, you know, who am I to him? He doesn't care, you know, whatever. And after three days, he, he made a complete reading to me. with And he gave me the uh, last name Lambert because I thought, you know, I'm Latskovic, I will do Lasovic, something very similar, you know. But he gave me the name Lambert because, first of all, he said, how will you explain why all of a sudden you are Lasovic, you know? But if you say, La uh, and then he created the whole story about it, you know, tell them, you know, in the in the city department that that uh, your ancestors, they were Lamberts, but they lost papers during documents during the World War Two. You know, he, he created all this story, how to get a new name. And really, really, after that, uh, my life started to uh, finally, you know, go somewhere. I wasn't in this pit spinning around. I, I started to live and started to grow. Uh, first, I, in my entire life, I had issues with money and jobs. I would always be paid, you know, very little. You know, I was dissatisfied with jobs. So I started, I started to find jobs that were uh, paid more and more better and also that were closer to who I am. I'm into ecology, permaculture, uh, uh, you know, spiritual. So my job now, first of all, it is the best paid job I, I ever had. Second, it's close to me. It's hard, but it's closest to my nature. So mm, that's how actually we met. I went to the, my favorite shop was BU and BU. <laughs> and, and I've been going to this shop for like, I see you almost many times but we never talked and when i started talking to you <laughs> yeah we discovered that we have uh, things in common <laughs> yeah and that you you are also into organic and healthy living and all that. yes yes i know that you started your life as a christian and as we are in croatia or you were born yeah. in croatia or yugoslavia at the time uh, Croatia is part of Yugoslavia, and after the war, it separated. It was a communistic country, but I think that a lot of people uh, have had a tendency toward Christianity. This is now mostly Christian country. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember that my grandmother took me to church uh, often. So Tell me about yeah, your life as a child with being raised as a Catholic. Like, How was that? Well, uh, nothing was pushed on me, like my parents didn't force me, but I choose to go on Sunday school. In, in school, we had option to go to Sunday school, so I did. And I went through all the, um, how do you call them? Everything that the church does, you know, this, uh, I don't know the English names for it. There are certain things that you have to do to become a Christian, you know, like... Taking the blood uh, of Jesus and... Uh... Also that. There are a couple mm. of things that you have to do, go through to, in order to be uh, like a Christian, you know. And mm. I did that, but I didn't feel that it actually meant anything to me. Rather At the time? Just, uh, yeah, it was more like a form, you know, you have to go through this and but nothing happened to my consciousness because of it. Like what were the stories that you heard at the time being raised as a Christian Catholic that um, you believed? Well, uh, I believed in God and uh, Jesus was, uh, you know, like he was uh, taken to be a god, you know, he's like like a god and a son of God at the same time. And there was a, a lot of fear mongering, you know, you have to fear God and there are these commandments and deadly sins, stuff like that. And you believed it? Uh, well, yeah, I kind of feared it. And it was uh, about... Uh, uh, Jesus dying on a cross, it was a big thing. It was more of a thing than what he was saying, actually, than his teachings. And we often had, you know, for Christmas, we had uh, movies about Jesus and the crucifixion and stuff like that. So it was forced, this crucifixion thing, which now I don't believe it's 
so important, but the words that he was saying, the message. I still uh, do believe, or I don't know, I, I accept Jesus, but not as maybe not, not so much as God. And this cru crucifixion is not so important to me as much as what he was doing while he was alive. His message. For, for how long you stayed as a Christian? Uh, till I was a teenager. Then I started to ask questions. And as we had a Sunday school in high school also, uh, I started believing in reincarnation. And when this question was raised in the Sunday school, they said, oh, it's like, you know, you're going into another bodies. You know, I said, no, that's not reincarnation. And so they didn't explain it well, and they disregarded it as something that is not true. So, And as I felt it to be true, I just couldn't accept Christianity anymore. And it didn't give me answers. They didn't know anything, who is God, who is soul, you know, nothing like that. It was just stories and these uh, sins and stuff, and I just couldn't live like that. Hmm. And I was uh, more and more into uh, Eastern culture, Eastern philosophies, Eastern religion. But how you heard about the reincarnation in Croatia at that time? Oh, uh, it was more and more popular. And also my mom had anxiety attacks. And so she was trying to heal herself. And she tried psychologists and doctors and none of it worked. So she turned to meditation and, and Eastern stuff. So this is how she opened the gate for me too. This is how I heard about it. She, she had many books from Sai Baba and so on. And then as I first connected to it, then it resonated and I started to explore. And you told me that you were not fitting in school. Is it because also of the faith or... No, no, it has nothing to do with faith because, you know, most of people, even those who go to school and, and go to Sunday uh, church and all that, I mean, they don't show it in their behavior. So it's not important whether you are a believer or not. It's not like you are disregarded if you are atheist or anything else. You know, people are living secular lives. They're not very spiritual, <laughs> even if they're religious. So it doesn't matter, really. Yeah, I didn't fit in because... Um, First of all, high school, I did fit in when I was in primary school. But when I joined the uh, secondary school, it was economics. And I was more into nature and stuff. So the people who were there, I just, you know, didn't like their style. I didn't like going out. I was more into, you know, meditation and nature and stuff like that. And they were more like going out on Fridays and drinking and smoking and I don't see myself in that. <laughs> yeah, mm. more like that. It happened to me during the masters when I came to Europe. Like going to the bar was something essential every day. Like uh, they yeah. meet, they meet at the bar, and I also wasn't into <laughs> it. So, so it affected my social life. Yeah, me too. And the fun fact is that later I was my first boyfriend was musician and I had to go with him to bars and constantly, you know, and nightlife, which I didn't like at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it didn't last very long. What happened then that you got introduced to Krishna consciousness? And... It, it was uh, a lot uh, sometime later, like 15 years later, I had my freedom to experiment with spirituality, meditations, different organizations. And uh, then I even became, after I was with musicians and uh, was uh, in a belly dancing. Only after that happened Krishna consciousness. I met uh, one guy, who, he was uh, he was doing uh, classes on self-healing, like self-help. And he also uh, mixed that with uh, Vedic knowledge. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that he was a devotee in Krishna consciousness. But I really resonated with how he explained Vedas and this EFT. He was actually doing EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique, and he mixed it with Vedas. And he was very charismatic. What is Veda? Uh, Veda is uh, Indian uh, scripture. Uh, I mean, it's huge. It, 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 it talks about philosophy, it talks about uh, the religion, the, uh, everything. Uh, Ayurveda. Ayurveda is uh, like... Uh, it's also part of Vedas. Oh, oh. Then also we have a Kama, 
Sutra, it's also part of Vedas. Kama Sutra is about, you know, men and a woman being together. It's not just about sex. It's about uh, the re relationship. It's also part of Veda. And you have this uh, incantations. It's also like Rig Veda. There are many types of Vedas. But the Vedas that we were learning were called Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. And it's about Krishna, you know, and his pastimes and philosophy, religion, basically. But I know about Ayurveda. I know that it's Ayur, uh, I think, means uh, life and Veda means... As far Ayurveda as Ayurveda means knowledge. 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 It's so knowledge. it's the life. Yeah. Ayurveda means the life knowledge. Knowledge about life. It's it's basically knowledge about health. It's about health. You know what to eat, when to eat, when to go to sleep, stuff like that. So Veda is the knowledge, like knowledge about relationships, about maybe everything, faith. everything, everything that exists in uh, cosmos. So this guy was teaching knowledge. Uh, uh, she, she, he was teaching the Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, verses from that, and philosophy through that, but from the point of view of Krishna consciousness. Because, you see, there are many sampradayas in India, sampradaya meaning the school of thought. And mm. each guru, acharya, or whatever, they have their own explanation of Vedas or Bhagavad Gita. So... Uh, Hare Krishna have teacher called Srila Prabhupada and so this was his version how he saw how he explained the Vedas mm. so it's different than some other Acharya from some other school of thought in India so there are many school of thought in India yeah <laughs> it, yeah so he thought that he's the only one who is right and you know so so he wrote a book Bhagavad Gita as it is you know, there is Bhagavad Gita, but he wrote a book, Bhagavad Gita, as it is. Like, he's the only one right. He, he only gets it right. Uh -huh. you know, nobody else. Uh -huh. So that's like that. And he's pushing uh, Krishna. Uh, Krishna is one of the incarnations of God. You have Vishnu, Krishna, Ram, blah, blah, blah. And so uh, Hare Krishna or Prabhupada, they're pushing Krishna as the, uh, the main uh, version of God, you know. So if you're mm -hmm. not believing in blue a blue boy with flute, then, you know, you're not believing in God or something like that. So uh, just let me make sure I understand. Because okay. I already made a documentary with the Krishna community in Hungary, okay. in the Krishna Valley near the Balaton Lake. So it's a big uh -huh. community of Krishna I've been there. devotees. Yeah. yeah. And, they have a village. Uh, yes. And they grow organic, sustainable, uh, all the things yeah. that me and you are interested in yes 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 this is what got me hooked oh, yeah. this is why i thought you know the krishna karnik is good because uh also this guy kakudmi das who who uh showed all that to me he was into building a society on land and i was into land and i wasn't necessarily into krishna Kanji, but i was into land i wanted to do that uh -huh. and so i went to this uh, uh farm on in in hungary yeah but uh -huh. So when I went, I was um, mainly, the film I, I shot was about me discovering mm -hmm. the Krishna consciousness movement. And also I was more into children and how they are raised in such a community. And is it like, is it good to be isolated from the world and just be with Krishna devotees or, or, or you should be mixing with the other children. So that was the... That was my main goal of making this film. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't understand much of the Krishna philosophy itself. So can you explain to me, how does it explain the world? Like, and why the little blue child? Oh, the little blue child is the, you know, the, it, it, he's basically God. And to me, it doesn't matter how God looks like. To them, it does. But, you know, this is not so important in Krishna consciousness. I mean, it is, but to me, it isn't. I don't know how to explain it. But what's important is the way of life. Basically, they explain that we are living in Maya, in the illusion. And the point of life is to devote yourself to God, uh, which looks like a blue child with a flute, you know. So I, I, I don't care if it's blue uh, guy with the flute or somebody else. I mean, the point is to devote yourself to God, however you see him anyway. And then you do these austerities. You have to chant for two hours at least, 16 rounds of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. You have to read Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. You have to be surrounded by devotees. You have to eat prasadam, which is uh, food offered to God. 
and mm -hmm. did I forget anything? That's it, you know. So this is basically life. So it doesn't seem like something that would harm you. But what I have issue with is the way they relate to the body, you know, because they think that the body is a problem. They think that if you have a body, you are immediately uh, lusty, you know, mm -hmm. that you are sinful. And that's the problem because that creates an issue with self-love and self-acceptance. And also I noticed that there is uh, this tendency to, you know, uh, only think of God and they're not grounded in here now. They're, they're not loving themselves. They, they want to be somewhere in uh, someplace else with God and not here. And I think that's, you know, this is not why we came here. We came here to exp to experience the material life, whatever it is, you know. This is our service to God, to experience for him how it is to be us. I want you to go back to the period when you were in the Krishna community. Yeah. And I know that you lived with them for a few years. I lived with them from uh, for four years, actually. Four years. So in you believed it and you were living it. I so, tried to believe it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was you trying tried. to do my best. I dived deep into this lifestyle, into lifestyle of a monk. It's ah. not the lifestyle of every Hare Krishna because there are four stages. Brahmachari, it's a monk, it's a young disciple. Then you have Grihasta, who is a family person. It's when you have been a Brahmachari some time, and then after some uh, after you finished your you know, like schooling with guru, then you are now starting family. After that, then there is a... Um, when you're starting to leave the family life and going into uh, Vanaprastha, living into a forest. In India, uh, 5,000 years ago, after being a Grihasta family person, then you would move into forest. You would start to, you know, like dissociate with the society. And mm -hmm. then after that, you would become a sannyasi, like a mm -hmm. teacher, guru and that. So I was in a brahmachari phase and it was like a monk, basically, which is not a true life. It's just you're focused on your Srimad Bhagavatam, you're focused on your Japa Mala, chanting Hare Krishna and preaching also. You go outside, you give books and you talk about Hare Krishna and you sing. Singing is a great uh a big deal in Hare Krishna movement. Like for promotion and also to live the joy, right? Yes, yes. I liked singing and instruments. I liked it a lot, yes. I didn't like so much giving books and preaching because it, it was painful. I mean, so much rejection. People don't want to hear about it, you know. But playing music, you just play and somebody, you know, stops and listens and give you a coin or two and that's mm. fine. So can I can I understand when you were at this stage, how did you see or explain life? Like that there was a God who's, who looks like it or incarnate in like a child and he created the world? or Like, like a what? blue boy with a flute. Yeah, he, he's a creator, but he looks like a child. And also the, the view is I am here in physical world and this is Maya illusion. This is not real. So my goal is to come back to Krishna. That was the goal of life. It was like um, trying to escape this material world as soon as possible just to be with Krishna again. And it made that sense was... to you, right, at that time? Yeah, of course, of course, mm. it, it made. But then I could later see consequences of rejecting the body, and eventually I got sick. <laughs> uh, tell me so... about the... Like, yeah, I, I, I know that you got sick for a while. So what was it and what was the story of that? I lived in a temple in Zagreb. It was in Gainice. And uh, we had some uh, issues in our yatra. Yatra meaning the, you know, people, the con uh, congregation. And that there were some, that there were two uh, fr uh, fractals, you know, they were fighting. And uh, I was uh, living in a temple and there were people attacking the temple president and they wanted to take over the temple. So it was like a war, let's say. And so they uh, sent me to Slovenia in their temple. They didn't have this issue. So I was living there. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. At some point I asked myself, will I live like this forever? Because I gave up my apartment. I didn't have a job. And there, it was difficult to get out of it. And I was wondering, will I live like this forever, you know? 
I don't want to do that. And there was the one lady who was living there for like 20 years and she was miserable. <laughs> mm. uh, but the issue was, it was an old building and we were uh, in Hare Krishna movement, cl cleanliness is a big issue. You have to be clean. If you go to the toilet, you have to wash yourself. You know, if you went uh, with your garments in the toilet, you have to change them. So there is a lot of washing going on, you know, mm. and women were uh, drying their clothes uh, inside. So there were a lot of mold on the ceiling. Mm. And I got, I think I got reaction to the mold, but also mm. Hare Krishnas uh, have a lot of feasts. Every Sunday you have a feast. And, and and the food is a lot of uh, flour, sugar, fat, which I don't consider to be very healthy. So this uh, unhealthy diet combined with mold created uh, allergic reaction to me that I, I I wasn't able to breathe. You know, I was coughing, mm. and I was coughing so much that I couldn't you know I couldn't speak at all. And I was a useless. I couldn't, you know, wake up in the morning for the program. And program was in the five uh, in the morning. You know, mm -hmm. I couldn't do my services on the altar. I couldn't go out in Hari Nams for playing music and offering books. So I was useless to them. And so actually, some devotees told me, you know, what's that? Either go to the, you know, program or leave, do something, you know. And so I decided to come back home. And actually, this was my uh, escape home. This offered me to come back to material life again and to Zagreb and to my family, you know. Because in Hare Krishna movement, also there is this uh, fight with the family, you know. They are not devotees, so they are uh, karmis. Karmis mean uh, material people. They are demons, you know. So you are not allowed to really, you know, be with them unless you are preaching to them, which makes a lot of problem with, relate with relating to your family, so. You were like disconnected from your family as long as you were with the Krishna devotees? I, I saw my mom, basically, and I visited, but I was disconnected, yes. Mm. And my mom had issue with this also, you know. She she liked uh, Hare Krishnas from afar, and she liked to see them in the city, but she didn't like that I am with them in the temple and all this, and yeah. And this deity worship, and I come back to her because I was sick. I was worshiping deities, and she didn't like that, especially when I was telling her about these cleanliness things that you know you have to be clean. You have, don't. You must not try the food before they're offered to Krishna and stuff. And she she got you know like stop it, please. <laughs> she, she she got you know crazy with that. So so even when you left, you still believed, but uh, but just because you were sick. I left in 2014, and I left the movement completely three years later. Oh. Yeah, so I was, uh, three years, I was in turmoil. You know, is it okay? What is Maya? Is, is Hare Krishna Maya, or in this, is this material life? What is Maya? What is real? What is not real? What is right? What is my truth anyway? You know, it, it was a struggle. Mm -hmm. Because I had many issues with Hare Krishna when I was living there, but I was surrounded with them. But when I went out, I wasn't surrounded so much with that because this is a recipe for brainwashing, you know, mm -hmm. only reading this, only doing that, only being with such people. This is brainwashing, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I was back with my mom, I I wasn't with the devotees so much and I wasn't into this ch uh, chanting and reading so much. And I could see material world and other influences so I could finally decide for myself what is true. Oh, so it took you three years. Three years, and it was painful. It's like uh, when you change religion or belief, it's like a world is falling apart. You, you're, you're so invested in it. You believe in it. And then you suddenly realize that it's not true. It's like, you know, your carpet is moved under your feet. You know, you, you've, it's a horrible feeling. Yeah, your whole world collapse. Yeah, crumbles. Mm. Yeah. And there was this one book, Our Universal Journey. When I saw this book, I know that if I read it, uh, my Hare Krishna life will be over. It will be finished. But I read it anyway, because I needed to know the truth. Mm. What was it yeah. about, Our Universal? It was about the organic matrix and synthetic matrix. 
and that religions and some uh, new age beliefs are basically pretending to be light, but they are synthetic light. So they are actually, you know, uh, hidden uh, uh, evil or something, let's say it like that. And so I recognized the Hare Krishna movement and worshipping of devotees to be actually the false light. Mm. And I also went after I got sick, I went to exorcist also. And he told me, I don't know who are, who you are worshipping, but it's not God. Exorcist is like someone who, if you have a, a demon on you, he can... Yes, yes. I look like this. <laughs> I was sucked. I was uh, so skinny. I, I was without energy. I looked horrible, you know. I mean, this disease obviously took the toll. But we went to this guy also, and he's doing healing, but also he's an exorcist. And he saw that there is energetically something seriously wrong here, and that whatever I was doing, it wasn't God worship. The guy who you went to to get this demon out of you, is he related to Christianity? No, he was a Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> he was a Muslim. <laughs> yes. Oh. But... I mean, if he can get uh, me rid of demons, why not, you know? <laughs> and did he? So, uh, actually, yeah, he helped me later to mm -hmm. regain. I, I was on a, I was on smoothies. I, I changed my diet. We bought a blender. So I was uh, drinking. I didn't want to go to the doctor and take antibiotics and all this. I was doing it naturally. It took me seven months, by the way, to get my immunity back. And I went to this guy, uh, exorcist. And so, and I was a lot in nature. I was walking barefoot a lot, so uh, I finally, after seven months, I got myself back. <laughs> ah, walking barefoot for grounding. For grounding, and now I'm using my uh, grounding mat that is connected to my grounding installations, so I'm grounding constantly now. Grounding is very important because we are animals who are constantly ungrounded. Yeah, I also I also have a, a grounding sheet, but I'm not sure if it's working. So, <laughs> well, uh, I bought uh, two things. I have one that measures the utility. I mean, the grounding in the in the wall, and then I have the other that uh, it's multimeter that shows me uh, when I step on my mat, it shows me that I'm you know I'm zero, I'm grounded. You mm. know? So I I can measure it. You have to have this to know that the that the thing actually operates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so you tried this healthy lifestyle and then this guy was maybe reading things on you or something? Or I went to him a couple of times, 10 times. Uh, he was doing, you know, crystal therapy, this therapy, that therapy. I was on zappers for uh, parasites and he was so doing something. He's a Muslim and he was using crystals. He was doing all kinds of stuff, okay. <laughs> you know, like for, for, for purification, for detox. Oh. But also he was famous in uh, Bosnia. He was famous as an exorcist. Ah, oh, he's so, from Bosnia. Yeah, he, he returned to Bosnia. He's not here anymore. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me let me go over your career because it's very interesting what you have been doing. It's not only yeah. that you change the, the the beliefs, but also you. I think you are on a journey also to understand who you are, what you want to do in life, and yes, uh, you you started with the drums. Uh, yeah, first for horses, because they are my greatest love, and I love them till this day. I haven't been with horses for 25 years, but I'm with them inside. And then there were drums. My first two boyfriends were actually drummers, and first was uh, one was into African drum and drum circles, like doing it traditionally and spiritually for therapy. And with that, uh, so I was learning to drum with him, and from that, I went into dancing. Because mm -hmm. as we were in Dubrovnik on, playing on the streets, I heard the finger symbols, you know, playing. And we went to look for it. Who, who is making this sound? And the sound was made by a beautiful American belly dancer, Suzanne Frankovic. She has roots in, in, in Yugoslavia, in Montenegro. So mm -hmm. she came from America to see the land of, he, of, of her grandfather. And this is how I met her. And when I saw her dance, I was like, you know, 
usually when women see belly dance, it, it, it does something in them. It's not so much about seducing men. It's not about that. It's about women and what this dance does to a woman who is dancing. And, you know, I don't dance anymore actively. I'm not leading any courses or anything, but I see it as something that every woman should do for her own spiritual and uh, physical and mental health, really. So you were you were working as a belly dancer? I was having a school of belly dance. Uh, Suzanne was having her courses for a month and then she come, uh, she went back home. And then, you know, all the women who were on her course, they wanted more. They begged me to please do something, continue. I, I was dancing only three months. I mean, I was not, I wasn't much better than them, mm -hmm. but they needed somebody, you know, who would lead them. And so I really, really, you know, killed myself to get that knowledge. And there was no YouTube videos and stuff like that. Then it was, uh, I, I had to buy DVDs, you know, and learn from them. And it was a struggle. But it was a labor of love, really, because I love belly dance still. I, I use it still for stretching. And when I'm cooking or something, doing something in the kitchen, I occasionally do some movements. If I have cramps in my belly, I do belly dance moves. So mm -hmm. I highly recommend belly dance to all the women, no matter how old you are. I mean, do it for because it is spiritual. It is grounding. It connects you to earth. It connects you to the tribe, you know. And this is something that we lost in the city. And the dance that I was doing was called uh, American Tribal Belly Dance. You know, it, it was about a group improvisation. The, they had the language through the movements. Each movement was a sign and they had the language. That there was a one leader and she was doing moves and others would pick up the language. And this is how they could improvise on the spot looking like this is a choreography. And uh, also, it is not just that the, the one is leader, they would change the roles constantly. And this is the beauty, because you get to be a follower and a leader all through the dance. And, you know, do you have this language, you know, this connection to the women with, with whom you are dancing. And why you didn't continue? Oh, well, I had uh, life uh, problems, I mean, with money. Uh, as I was, I was trying to open my own school, but eventually ended up hungry because mm -hmm. my costs were higher than what uh, than the in income and I ended up being hungry for two months. I was eating like three slices of bread and a glass of water for two months. Mm -hmm. And I lost a lot of kilos because of that. Like I fell down to 45 kilos, which is 90 pounds. And I stayed that way for 15 years. I, I cannot gain weight anymore. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, so, so it it's not only the sickness. Like, when was that between the before the Krishna or after? This was way before Krishna. Uh, mm -hmm. I stopped dancing actively as a professional dancer in 2009, and I joined the movement in 2011. Actually, I joined the temple, so it was two years after. I got sick from <laughs> living in the temple in 2014. So I was hungry in 2009 and I got sick from bad food in 2014. Mm. So there were like five years of difference. Yeah. So I see you are trying all the time to find your passion. You're trying to make yeah. it work. You're trying to understand this experience of life. Yeah. Well, I understand that uh, Mia Lambert, I mean, my last question, whoever I am, my human self likes diversity and likes to likes risking and likes different experiences. For example, my mother, you know, she has her bubble and, you know, she doesn't like changes, but I like changes. I like to feel, even if it's risky, even if I will, you know, pay for it, but I like to try it. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is what we came here to do, to try, you know. To experiment. To experiment, yeah, life is experiment, you know. And anyway, you are a soul, you cannot die anyway. <laughs> Based this life somehow you will have another chance or whatever uh -huh. at least this is what i believe for so, now for now yeah <laughs> yeah it, it it constantly changes yeah my mm -hmm. beliefs constantly change and, and awareness is constantly changing and you know it, it, mm. it opens more and more so let's talk about love and relationships this is i think is a very important step or point on the life timeline of any human being yeah yeah so what is your story with love and relationship and how how did it unfold 
Well, my blueprint was a bad one. As I grew up with a dysfunctional family, I didn't have any relationship with my father. I lived with him for 20 years, but he didn't pay attention to me. So it uh, massively reflected on my relationship with men. And when I was young and my hormones were raging, I would always fall in love with a guy who didn't, uh, who, who wasn't interested in me. You know, I would, I would just, you know, suffer, suffer and suffer. I would look at him, but I would not, never dare to approach him because I didn't know how to approach men. And I would be with guys who fell in love with me and we were friendly kind of, but I wasn't in love with them. And this was the story of my love life for now. Uh, I had four boyfriends. I had many uh, guys that I fell in love with, and some of them really resembled my father because I was constantly looking for the love of my father, which I couldn't get. But like I said, I would be with guys who, uh, that I did, didn't love. So uh, my first boyfriend, he was a nice guy. He was older than me, like 13, 14 years older. And we, uh, uh, he was my friend. I, I saw him as a friend. You know, but eventually I told him, look, you're too old for me. I don't love you like that. We can be friends. I appreciate you, but sorry. You know, we were together for six months. Mm -hmm. Then most dramatic and most important uh, person in my life was my second boyfriend, who was also a drummer. When I saw him, uh, I thought, oh, my God, what, what an egoistic person. You know, he was a musician and he was full of himself, you know. And he thought about me, oh, what an amoeba. Because I, I, amoeba, you know, the, 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 yeah. spineless, the yes. spineless being, yeah. Because uh, my motto was uh, back then, you know, live and let live. But I would allow people to literally shit on my head. You mm -hmm. know, I had no self-esteem. And he saw that, you know. And so we started as like being friends, but he little by little, you know, he... I felt like I was a fly who was trapped in a spider's net. Mm. This is how I felt about him. And this was uh, the worst uh, years of my life ever because we were fighting constantly. And I told him, I was screaming at him, leave my house. I don't want to be with you. I don't love you. But no, my no meant absolutely nothing. He crushed all my borders. But uh, now when I look at it, I feel that our souls, you know, made an agreement prior to birth that he will teach me how to gain my self-esteem back, you know, because mm. through struggle with him, I learned to love myself. I learned to respect myself. And when I learned that, he slowly faded out of my life. So he is my greatest teacher. I don't hate him at all. I wouldn't want to be with him now, <laughs> of course, but I appreciate what he has done for me on a soul level, really. Uh, when I see it now, uh, he was un, uh, unavoidable. This relationship was unavoidable. He had to be in my life, even though it was very hard. And then I had uh, two more attempts that failed because it was just superficial and empty. And then when I was 30, I just stopped dating men. And that was it. So I'm single for like 15 years. Oh. No. Yeah. And uh, the interesting thing is that I love it. I love it. You know, mm. because I finally feel that I know who I am, you know, and what am I about? And I'm, I rediscovered myself. And maybe from that point, maybe I will be able to be with somebody. I don't know. But I don't mm. care. Even if it doesn't happen, I'm, you know, happy with myself mm -hmm. and what I do. Yeah. So that also was a journey. <laughs> yeah, of course. We often uh, do not choose easy lives. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think that any human being is living yeah. an easy life. Those who are, they're not learning much. No, but I don't. I don't know. I I disagree with you that every everyone is having some challenges. Yeah, of course. I mean, you can't come to life and leave it without any problems. <laughs> yeah, think. there is always. I mean, the density, the limitations. Yeah. the time if you want something there has to be some time until it is realized so it's definitely frustration for the soul you know nothing is easy no. <laughs> uh, but now let's see how like i'm trying now to see how you after all those experiences uh, and as i said at the beginning your life i see your life as a rich life you tried you yeah. experimented 
So now, do you have an understanding of what is this existence? Well, I was guided to uh, the book of Anita Murjani. She's my first near-death experiencers, uh, experiencer. And uh, she was the one to lead me into this direction. And since I didn't fall for uh, like scriptures and religions, I liked uh, near-death experiences because this was about their experience. It was not knowledge, like uh, something you read. It's something that they experienced. So I trusted it. And so I learned about the soul, the uh, this uh, time pre-birth where you are actually arranging your life and how this life whatever it is it is beautiful it's uh, magical and you're here to learn you know? and you don't have to do anything special just be here and experience that's it so this is uh, what, what is my belief now and i learned that from near-death experiences. Uh, she was my first, then my second was Melan Thomas Benedict. And then I discovered this channel, Next Level Soul, where uh, Alex Ferrari, the uh, host, he has all this, you know, he has like 30 of them and channelers and stuff. And this is where I, I'm just gobbling them up. I'm watching them. I'm binge watching them all the time. So mm. this is now uh, what I truly resonate with. That we choose to come to this life. This is what you believe. Yeah. Yes, we chose here, everything happens uh, not to you, but for you. You chose these experiences. You chose to play with different uh, emotions, fear, obstacles, you know. This is mm. this is a, a, like a college for us, for, for our soul, you know. This is hard stuff. But we don't remember. Uh, some people do. Some people come with remembers, but most choose not to remember because it will ruin all the fun. You know, if you know everything, if you know the rules of the game and, you know, everything, then what's the mm. point? You know, you cannot uh, learn so much if, if you know that it's all a game and it's like simulation and it's just a learning, you know, then you miss wow. a lot of it. So the uh, not remembering is a big part of it, not for everybody, but for most of us. Hmm. But for me, when I think about it, I see that we have different personalities and characters. And some people, they do love life and they find it interesting to be in. And others, like me, for example, I, if I had the choice, I wouldn't choose to come. Uh, so it just this I, I heard this what you say this explanation of life that we choose to come to learn and go through things and experiment and challenge ourselves uh, because there is this um, uh, some universe or or the whatever that is uh, exists want to experience his existence through us. Like, that's how they say it. And uh, so how does it doesn't explain to me why why I, I don't have this feeling that I want to experience or I want to, I don't have, like, I don't, I don't desire to experience in the first place if I had the choice. Uh, some people choose by themselves, you know, that they, they wanted this. And some people, you, you, you have a soul group. And you agree with them on certain things. Maybe you were sent on a mission. Because there are people like you who, who don't want to be here. You know, you're not the only one. So maybe you were sent on the mission. And it wasn't, you know, something that you would like to do, but you agreed on it because, you know, the reward will be for everybody. It's like a sacrifice. And who you sent me? Like <laughs> who sent uh, me? You have a group. We all have, a, like, a soul group that... Uh, these are souls that are on your own vibration. And mm -hmm. in your team, you were the chosen because you had the the best skill, your best skills for, for the for, for the job, you know. You were the best. <laughs> That's why. Mm -hmm. So you, you're like boots on the ground. You know, we don't always love our jobs, but we, we are doing it because you know it's for humanity, it's for the company, it's for you know, this is for God. Mm. I believe that your soul is happy with it, but your human self isn't so much. So, mm. I don't know. I feel that 
it's it's a nice story that I would like to believe. I would suggest you look the channel Next Level Soul and find those who don't like to be here. And I tell you mm -hmm. that most of people who have near that experience do not want to come back. When you told me about this uh, podcast, I started watching yeah. a few episodes. Yes. Uh, I didn't yet meet uh, people who didn't want to. Uh, yeah, when they die, I, I heard that when they die, they yeah. don't want to go back to the body. But uh, yeah. I never heard they, of yeah. someone who doesn't want to exist. I did hurt, but I don't remember which one. I, maybe <laughs> if I stumble upon, I will send you a link. But uh, basically, mm -hmm. when they come back, they pay, they come back for several reasons. They either didn't finish what they started, oh. uh, because there are people who depend on them, like children, and what else? There, there was a couple of things, hmm. you know. And this makes sense to you? Absolutely, absolutely. So what you do is that from all those uh, near-death experiences and people who remember their previous lives, this is what and you are now. And before, yeah. Mm. This, this, is, what this, is you... how, this, this is how I learn now. This is my religion. This is what I believe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it is important to have belief that is optimistic and it is uh, constr uh, constructive. You know, mm. I have a friend who is an atheist and she's full of programs that are really, you know, closing her down and making her dysfunctional. And mm. that's not the point. If you're here, then you you have to find a way to have programs that will open you up for this experience. You know, mm. This is what I'm looking for. It has to be optimistic. It has to give me hope that this has the sense that uh, yeah. this experience you know i'm doing something you know with this yeah you need to do the best out of what you have yeah 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 mm -hmm. and enjoy the process you know and take it less serious if, if you don't know about this uh, pre-birth planning and that you are actually a soul we have a tendency to take things too seriously you know and that's mm -hmm. the problem and then you get into this fear if you know that you are a soul and that you you cannot be distracted uh, that you cannot be killed then you can loosen up and have fun mm. you know then it's not so serious so that's how you how you see life and it explains yeah. it answers all the, the mysterious questions like where did we come from or what is the meaning of life what will happen to yes, us after yes. we die all yes, questions everything, are, are everything. answered everything mm -hmm. it's it's this is amazing time that we are living now ever since corona started it's like the this gate opened and uh, it uh, enables consciousness to grow i mean mm -hmm. i was in spirituality for like 25 years and only last three years since corona started i had these you know revelations amazing revelations that changed my life so dramatically you know so this is a great time to really mm -hmm. to grow i i knew that i was a soul but I finally realized that I was, you know, intergalactic, that I am multidimensional being, you know, that this is just one small part of me. I'm, I'm much bigger mm -hmm. than this. My soul is huge. One uh, near death -er said that, you know, actually our soul is only partially dipped in the body, like, you know, only a toe or something, you know, <laughs> because it lives all these parallel lives uh, simultaneously. What we call here in the, in the body, we call, you know, past lives, future lives. Soul mm -hmm. has it all at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. we cannot even imagine it. If you would get the chance to come again, you would definitely come. Uh, probably, yeah. Maybe <laughs> would, I would go would someplace you, self. Would you choose like a more hard life or less hard? Well, it depends. Maybe I would take a time off, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a couple of thousands of years or something. Uh, you can so also let's... choose to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, rest time. But you can also choose to go to a different planet. You know, where there is, a, you know, better circumstances, you know, you don't have to be here all the time. Uh -huh. uh, you can, yeah, so. Okay, that's nice. <laughs> you have all the universe to choose from. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I, I can't finish this without uh, going over the permaculture, because it is also one of my passions. I've been interested yes. in it since maybe 2007 or something like that. Uh, my dream is to grow my own food uh, sustainably. I want to build my own house in an eco-environment way. Uh, and I see that you, like, per tell me first, permaculture, how do you see it? 
and then how like what steps are you taking into it a permaculture comes from the word permanent agriculture which means sustainable agriculture but it's not only about growing food it's about everything it's about yes growing food uh, without hurting nature harming it so it's giving back the nutrients uh, and there are several ways like uh, food forests you grow uh, trees then you, uh, each tree has like uh, six uh, bushes and 20 perennials this is like a guild and then you you make uh, several like trees like that fruit bearing trees so so the point is to have a system where you have a different food all over uh, the year, all throughout the year. So we have different apples, different uh, different cultures, different varieties, and they they grow from spring to autumn. You know, so you are your plants are taking care of you basically, and also you include uh, uh, medicinal herbs and whatnot. So this is one. Then there is this uh, bi biodynamic agriculture. This is philosophy for itself. I wasn't into it so much, so I cannot tell you much, but it's also you know preserving the soil. The the point of uh, per permaculture and the way how they grow food is not to uh, you know focus on growing the plant, but to feeding the soil, to preserving the soil because soil is full of fungi and microorganisms and they are the ones helping plants to grow. Mm -hmm. And also I noticed when we are talking about the soil and microorganisms, uh, fungi are very important. Fungi, fungi mushrooms, they live as mycelium. And what some of them do is that they uh, act as an internet for plants. They live in some symbiosis with the trees. And so they connect this uh, net, like uh, it's called woodwide net, uh, woodwide like internet, but for wood. So they're playing the role of external neurological system of trees. So mm -hmm. trees can communicate through mushrooms with other trees. Mm -hmm. And they can exchange nutrients, they can exchange information, they mm -hmm. can exchange water. So, for example, if these trees here have water and these trees there don't, then these guys will send water to, to these guys there. Mm -hmm. Also, the scientists discovered that through mycelium, plants uh, connect with their children. So mother trees knows who, who her children are. And so she's sending extra um, uh, nutrients to her children she's making elbow space for them in her root system so you know what is the children of trees baby trees baby trees <laughs> yeah you have like an oak there is a seed it falls mm -hmm. down and then there is a little little tree you know and mm -hmm. these are baby tree basically you know and mm -hmm. a mother tree knows her children mm -hmm. she knows which seeds are hers and she takes care of them and also big big trees uh, old trees they're like teachers to other smaller trees you know like there is community a community of trees and if they don't have these mothers who are old and wise these trees are susceptible to to diseases to you know all kinds of stuff i have in my i have one hectare from my grandfather and three quarters is under the forest and i have two forests one is older and then the other is uh, younger trees. And this older, they have uh, big trees and small trees. And they're, you know, going well. But this other, uh, you know, group of trees that are only young trees, they're weak, they're, they're falling down, they're having trouble. So, you know, what people do, they go, they go into forest and cut the biggest trees. And then you destroy mm -hmm. a forest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you destroy the... The ones who kill the bear mother. knowledge. <laughs> you kill the, the teacher, the mother, the leader, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. What are the steps that you are taking into permaculture? Well, the first was uh, one was to go on this uh, course, 72-hour course on permaculture design to get the view what the permaculture is and general idea about the growing foods, the building houses and uh, communities and storing the energy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you have to get a land. <laughs> Where did you take the course? It's in Zagreb. Uh, no, it's uh, it's near the Zagreb. It's in uh, Vukomeričke Gorice. It's mm -hmm. in Zmag. It's a green uh, network for activist groups, something like that. Zma mm -hmm. Aga. Mm. We will leave yeah. links to 
whatever yeah, yeah. we mentioned. I will send. I will. I will save. You, I will send you anything. You know, because they have many, many uh, courses, mm -hmm. and this seventy-two hour. It's about everything, and then they have separate courses on building buildings, like houses. Uh, of straw bale with a uh, wooden frame. And then you have separate course for making a, a green roof, which is when you have plants on the roof. And then they have these plasters, how to build a plaster for, for the house inside and outside, mosaics. And mm -hmm. I, I also took their course about uh, wild edible plants, how to recognize them in, in case of crisis, you know, that you can go to Slam or somewhere around and eat, you know, food from what, what which is available. We are living in, you know, we are surrounded by medicinal plants, but we don't know them. <laughs> and edible also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you started to build your own house? Or uh, not? No. Uh, first of all, permaculture is not a thing for one person, unless you are a man. Maybe men can do it. But a uh, woman, it's a uh, little bit harder, you know, because first of all, I have 45 kilos. I cannot lift, you know, like uh, wooden frames or whatnot. So mm -hmm. I really, you know, recommend you, you need a group, you need a family, you need a man at least. What is now like your plan for, um, like, what, where, where is your life going? Well, right now I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck. I would definitely need a man. And uh, I have issues with the land of my grandfather because, you know, in Croatia, we all have these disputes, uh, legal disputes about who is the owner. And without the paper that I am owner, I cannot, you know, continue with work because I don't have a man, I would have to pay workers. But I cannot pay for a, a job on something that is not mine. It's stupid, no. you know. So I have to first fix this uh, issue with papers. Then I can, you know, I have some money on the side to invest in this house but without this uh, being settled i cannot go forward and of mm. course finding a man would really really uh, you know make things easier mm -hmm. so but you cannot plan that you know you either find somebody or not you know mm. but until then i'm i'm here with my mom living in zagreb you know uh, learning as much as i can i don't know mm. is there something that you would like to experience Yes, I would definitely like to experience to have family and to live on land. Mm -hmm. uh, have you read a book? Uh, uh, it's called, it's a series of books called Ringing Cedars of Russia. There are 10 books and they're mm -hmm. about Anastasia. And Anastasia is one. Uh, she's a, a, a woman living in the middle of wilderness in Sibir. She mm -hmm. doesn't have a house. She doesn't plant anything. She lives completely in accordance with nature. She's super spiritual. She has uh, superhuman abilities like telepathy, teleportation. She's very knowledgeable uh, by uh, by connecting, you know, to knowledge. She, she knows whatever, whatever is happening in this world. And so she had this recipe for uh, heaven on earth, how we can change all these bad things happening on the planet, pollution, wars, this and that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, diseases and that. And she said, each family should have uh, one hectare of land, which she calls a king's domain. Like, mm -hmm. And the one hectare is 100 by 100 meters. And on this land, one quarter should be under the forest. Three quarters should be yours, you know, like a house and your garden and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, and by this, uh, you would be self-sufficient, there will be no poverty. There will be people would be healthy. You know, we would not have issues with uh, pollution because uh, if you are not using like pesticides and stuff like that. And uh, she really, these books really change your consciousness, and they really warm you up for the idea of living with the the, the land. You know. Mm. Yeah, so I yeah, recommend I... everybody to, to read this book because it will change you dramatically. Mm. This is how I got this spark. I, I had this inclination toward land a long time ago because of the horses. I wanted to own horses and you have to have land. But with Anastasia, you know, my need for, for land grew dramatically. Yeah, I also so, believe like I need the land as well. 
Yeah, yeah, we all do because this is not living. This is prison. You're living in a prison, and whatever your you know prison keepers tell you to do, whatever crisis they they inflict on you, you have to suffer it. You know, you mm -hmm. cannot find food. You have only your four walls. If something happens, hunger. There is no nothing on the shelves in the store. You're hungry. You know. Mm -hmm. Or like when uh, when you had a virus attacking the world. I mean, if you had the yeah. land, you could just survive in your own land. <laughs> yeah, you don't care, you know. And there are no crises as long as you live in in the city. First of all, it's not sustainable. It it's damaging mm -hmm. to people, to land, to everything, to earth. You know, mm -hmm. so we need to live uh, sustainably. I think that the earth as an entity will not allow destruction like this like we did last hundred and more years you know that mm -hmm. in the future we want to survive here we will have to you know mm -hmm. cooperate with her mother earth <laughs> mother earth yes absolutely uh, you know this land that i have with my grand i don't visit that land so often this year i i have been there for maybe five times i didn't grow anything there this year and i had potatoes growing out of nowhere you know mm -hmm. like how <laughs> no. So I believe that this this land, and this is what Anastasia says, the land that you own, your kin's domain, it protects you, it cares for you, it loves you. And I really feel that land is a person, mm -hmm. you know, we have interaction and it loves you unconditionally. Uh, I also grow some plants in the balcony. I try yeah, to make too. my, my <laughs> little <laughs> my little land. And uh, yeah, I feel the abundance, you know, like you plant one seed and you get a lot. So I can imagine if I can grow a whole land, I will not need anything. Anastasia says that, that when you grow a plant for food, every leaf, uh, there is your name written on every leaf. This plant grows for you mm. because it, it spiritually grows by serving you, you know, by giving you itself, you know, mm. so... And she also has the special procedure that when you are growing your own food for your own self, how to inform uh, the plant how you need. So you, you know, put a seed and spit, you know, and mm. so that the, the seed uh, gets your information, then you plant it in the ground and then mm. uh, step on it with your feet. So mm. it gets full information of your condition, what's wrong with you, what you need. And then this plant will give you, you know, it will take for you nutrients that ex you need specifically. Mm. Mm. This is her philosophy. You know? Yeah, interesting book. I will also send me a link to put it in the description. Yeah, 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 of course. Okay, Mia, thank you so much. I really enjoyed going through your rich <laughs> life. life. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I really wish that your dream come true you get the land you start growing your own food make your own home find love and yes enjoy this experience of existence this time <laughs> yeah in this in this life yes <laughs> in this in this try in this game <laughs> yeah so thank you for sharing your life story and uh, for allowing me to document it in the scrapbook of life and uh, I wish you all the best on my journey to understand life I would like to meet you and document your life story in the scrapbook of life send a summary of the story to the email in the description box or the show notes just few requirements you need to be over 40 years old you changed your belief and you have answers to the mysterious questions of life this journey of mine started when I met Wang Tsong Yang in a documentary film, and you can watch it below. My thirst to answers is pushing me to discover and meet more people who are living this life experience to the best possible way, through their own belief. Who is next? And which belief? I'm open to all possibilities.